But yes, I mean, American Crusade, how the Supreme Court is weaponizing religious freedom. You know, one of my, I think one of my, my favorite parts of that is actually the, the, the dedication to the book, uh, mm. which is, I dedicated it to all the Christian nationalists out there in America. We're not coming for your rights. We're coming for your privilege. Hey, so anyway, Andrew, where are you sitting as we speak? I am in Madison, Wisconsin. Okay. Uh, well, I'm in yeah. I'm in Massachusetts, just north of Boston, and oh, it's a nice, clear day here. Cold. Yeah, about the, it's about the same here. It's actually it unseasonably warm. I think we're we're almost hitting fifty, which is kind of crazy. Yeah. And when did the when I forget, but when did the book actually come out? I've got the pub date right here in front of me, but when was it? So American Crusade was September of 22, uh, mm -hmm. and the founding myth was 2019, I think, May. Yeah, uh, so 22 is your latest publication. Yes. And yes. are you still sort of, as we discuss this, are we treating this like a new book? Yeah, yeah, I'm still, you know, I'm still on the road here and there uh, mm -hmm. talking about it. I was just down in, I was down in New Orleans uh, yeah. a couple of weeks ago doing it, uh, did a big, big convention here in Madison, um, likely going to Southern California sometime in the near future uh, to do a, a tour there. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, yeah, very much. Still. When you were down in New Orleans, did you happen to see our buddy James Carville? I didn't. Um I, I I don't I have not yet personally met him, though. I was thrilled to see uh, somebody sent me a clip of him on Bill Maher saying that Christian nationalism is the biggest threat to the Republic. And I feel like I've been screaming that for five years. So I'm, I was he, thrilled he to called hear me a couple of days before that. And we went through that whole thing because he knew he was going to be doing oh, that. With cool. Bill and then then two days later, we did a podcast with him, just like I'm doing here. Uh, with you today so we're we're we've got a tight little circle of people here we're all talking to each other right hey, uh so anyway let me introduce you correctly this is sure. frank schaefer um and you are listening to and or watching in conversation with frank schaefer which is a podcast that goes out first as a live event on facebook and then goes where podcasts go and substack and all the rest and i will be promoting that but today i'm, I'm actually really thrilled because um, I'm talking to someone who I have been following and I have a lot of quotes from his book here um, for real. The only sad thing is, is I read your book on Kindle. So I hope you have a copy handy to hold up. Oh, I can do that. Yeah. Let me grab it. Yeah, there Hold up go. your book. Um, <laughs> there, we go. there it is. There uh, it is. It's American Crusade and it's by Andrew Seidel. And um I'm trying to get the whole thing. Yeah, The Founding Myth was another book of yours, Why Christian mm -hmm. Nationalism is Un-American. And this new book, 2022, The American Crusade, How the Supreme Court is Weaponizing Religious Freedom. Mm -hmm. And so um, I'm a big fan of the book. Um, it, you Thank know, you. an overused phrase is a must read. But in the case of your book, it is kind of a survival manual for anybody that doesn't <laughs> want to see religious liberty issues used as a bludgeon with which to destroy mm -hmm. everybody else's liberty. Um, I've got a quote here that I'm going to read. It's short from page 229, uh, just to sort of give a flavor of the book. Um, it's in the latter part of the book, but it's a good setup. So here it goes. Weaponizing religious freedom enshrines Christian privilege into the Constitution, but it also cripples our government's ability to, quote, promote the general welfare. One of the central purposes for which it is ordained according to the preamble to the constitution this is an unspoken goal of the crusade and by the way andrew's calling the people working on the christian right the religious right the white nationalist movement all these folks crusaders it's a good choice of words <laughs> continuing his quote making civil government impossible um usher us closer to replacing the rule of law with god's law and all i can say is is this fits so well with everything we've been talking to all kinds of people about including marcy hamilton who i just oh, did uh, work yes. with uh kate cohen who by the way when i was interviewing kate said well it's good you're talking to me but you really should be talking to uh andrew seidel <laughs> and um anthea butler said the same thing so basically every <laughs> other guest we've had on for the last month has been saying why aren't you talking to andrew here we're talking to andrew because you literally and figuratively have written the book on the subject. So <laughs> <laughs> I have a lot of quotes. I can help you go through the book and all the rest of it, but I'm just going to let you sort of 
paint the general problem as you see it. And as you know, I came out of the religious right myself. So you're yeah. talking to one of the instigators of this problem. I toured around the country in the 70s and 80s with my dad and C. Everett Koop, telling people that we needed to bring America back to God mm -hmm. through our film series, Whatever Happened to the Human Race. And I've spent the last 35, 40 years trying to undo the damage. And part of that is talking to you today. So have at it. Well, thank you uh, for the, all those kind words. I mean, I'm thrilled uh, to hear those those words from my colleagues too. I'm a huge admirer, admirer of of Marcy's work. You know, she and I have worked together since the Hobby Lobby case, actually back in 2014, so more than a decade. And mm -hmm. and Kate Cohen's new book is brilliant. I mean, what a phenomenal writer. And I don't think there's anybody I hold in higher esteem than Kate Cohen and Anthea Butler. So that's just lovely to hear. Um, but yes, I mean, American Crusade, how the Supreme Court is weaponizing religious freedom. You know, one of my, I think one of my, my favorite parts of that is actually the, the, the dedication to the book, uh, mm. which is I dedicated it to all the Christian nationalists out there in America. We're not coming for your rights. We're coming for your privilege. And yeah, which I thought was great, by the way. Well, well thank you. And I mean, I love the way you said it about bludgeoning uh, in your intro, because really religious freedom has long been a shield. It is, it is this hallowed protection against government overreach. It's the minority's protection against the tyranny of the majority. And it's a right that has long been guaranteed by a strong separation of church and state. Mm. But but not anymore. That That is really what we are seeing change. There's a well-funded, powerful network of Christian nationalist organizations and judges, talking about a billion-dollar shadow network here, that has been working to turn that protection of religious freedom that's enjoyed by all into a weapon of privilege and supremacy for the few. And thanks to the pact captured Supreme Court, they are winning case after case. And now religious freedom is the tool, the weapon of Christian privilege, of Christian supremacy. And this shadow network is waging this crusade to weaponize religious freedom. And it, re it really is it's a war of conquest. I mean, that's why I chose the phrase crusade. They're not looking to conquer land, but they're looking to conquer our constitution and remake it in their image. And yeah, America you, you point out in the book too, that they're doing it as a minority in terms of the demographics and the population. Oh, absolutely. And so, you know, you also have an aspect, I lived in South Africa for a year, you also have an aspect of a kind of an emerging ideological apartheid, not a racist apartheid, where an ideological minority, you know, very similar to the um, evangelical reformed Calvinists of South Africa, the white minority controlled the black majority. But I just want to jump ahead a little bit yeah. uh, to something from page 26. Again, a little quote I wanted to put in here as a setup. The Roberts Court has been demolishing the wall of separation between church and state one brick at a time ever since. And that's ever since this has been going with, mm -hmm. you know, exacerbated by Trump's appointments and so forth, and you go into Amy Coney Barrett and the rest. Quote continued, as it is doing this, it is also altering the definition of religious freedom and alarmingly turning it against state church separation. The Roberts Court has betrayed the founding American principle, often in the name of religious freedom. And, mm -hmm. and I think that kind of is a good summation. It's early in the book, like page 26 or something. But what I'm I like a lot of things about your book a lot. And I think one of the things that's so rich about the book is that after you've set up the basic argument, you go into great detail naming names of the foundations, mm. the groups, the people, the funding sources, how this machine works. And I think for your average American, the mind boggling scope and reach of these folks, once you combine money from the Koch brothers, the Heritage Foundation, um, all, you know, the individuals you name mm -hmm. that have spent tens of millions of dollars in a very long term project. So I don't know really where to start in the interview. So let me start here. Why don't you outline for us the kind of scope of what I'll just call the Crusader project and yeah. the longevity of it and some of the key people involved, both naming names of people and organizations? If that takes the whole program, so be it. Take your time. <laughs> Lay it out. You know, we're having a cup of coffee on a plane. I've never heard of any of this stuff. Explain it to me. Yeah. I mean, it, it's I, this is it's such a vast, powerful, well-funded network that I think it's really hard to even know where to begin with that question. But I'm going to begin with where, where you mentioned in that 
in that quote. I'm going to begin with the Supreme Court and and the capture of the United States Supreme Court by this movement, because I think that I think that is absolutely crucial. Uh, one of the things that I, that I really try to drive home for folks is that the conservative justices on the Supreme Court are not impartial jurists that are carefully working to determine the meaning of a constitutional provision without any bias, right? You don't pack a court, you don't capture a court to do that. Um, so I've said crusaders a few times, you define that term. I'll narrow it down slightly to the legal groups that make up this billion dollar shadow network. So we're talking about groups like Alliance Defending Freedom, the American Center for Law and Justice, the Beckett Fund for Religious Liberty, Liberty Council, First Liberty Institute, kind of this Orwellian word salad. Mm -hmm. um, and these are the groups that are filing lawsuit after lawsuit. They're the ones, who, the crusaders who are setting up the cases that the conservative justices can come knock down. And that accelerates once Trump took over. And honestly, it begins to look a lot like collusion, especially when we find out that these same groups and donors are whining and dining justices on private super yachts and on private jets and on island hopping vacations, none of which were disclosed, right? So the guy, the man who is sort of universally recognized now as the man responsible for orchestrating the hostile takeover of the Supreme Court is Leonard Leo. Yeah. And I think that's probably the best place to begin. So, and a former employee described Leonard Leo's mission like this. And I re really, I want everybody to understand this quote. He figured out 20 years ago that conservatives had lost the culture war. Abortion, gay rights, contraception, conservatives didn't stand a chance if public opinion prevailed. So they needed to stack the courts. They didn't stand a chance if public opinion prevailed, so they needed to stack the courts. That is what they did. And the reason this is so crucial and why it's so important to understand that mission is because it is professedly anti-democratic, right? They are admitting that what they are trying to do is subvert democracy. Mm -hmm. That, that, that is the goal. If they don't stack the court, the majority is going to rule. If they don't stack the court, democracy is going to work, right? So that is why they targeted the Supreme Court for this hostile takeover, why they tried to pack the court with crusaders. And overall, we know that Leo's groups spent $540 million, that's half a billion dollars that we know of, mm. trying to pack the court from 2014 to 2020. And you do not, you just simply do not spend that kind of money to buy an impartial court, right? Like that, that's not the goal when you're spending half a billion dollars. You don't just want impartial jurists. They bought a court. Mm -hmm. They bought one branch of our government. And, and one more thing that I think is useful for people to understand is uh, Leo's job in this fight to capture the court, he was described as, quote, the monitor of the nominee's ideological purity. Mm -hmm. And, and that means the judicial nominees. Sure. And this is this is the guy who is responsible for the confirmation of John Roberts, Sam Alito, Neil Gorsuch, Brett Kavanaugh, and Amy Coney Barrett. Mm -hmm. Right. That's five justices on the Supreme Court. Thomas is an old friend of his. He actually Leo was actually with Thomas while he was being confirmed and going through that that uh, fight to get on the Supreme Court. Sure. All six of them are or were members of the Federalist Society. So that's six votes on the Supreme Court. And yeah. Leo personally chose five of them for their crusader ideology. And let me just ask you one question here. And yeah. I know it's also in your yeah. book. What, what was his position to begin this? In other words, his organization or what position did he hold in terms of how this got going? I, I knew some of the early people in the Federalist Society mm -hmm. back in the day. My yeah. dad was going around the country lecturing, saying, we need to get into the court. I mean, my father actually was a proponent of this and said, yeah. we need to take, the, take over the judiciary. We need to do this. It was part of his book, A Christian Manifesto. Um, but what interests me is who is Leo? Where did he come from? And the mix, the second part of the question, if you can just remember to go here, Amy Coney Barrett is a good example of this, the kind of weird amalgam of the most far out, you know, reconstructionist, fundamentalist evangelicalism combined with basically 12th century Catholicism. Yeah. I just remember, and I'm only 71, but as a child growing up in an evangelical fundamentalist home, to us, Catholics weren't even Christians. Yeah. They weren't going to heaven like good Protestants. Yeah. And I mean, we, that's, we, yeah, that's... Yeah. And we've gone really from there to a mutual admiration society of people whose 
just a little irony on the side, whose own theology cancels each other out if they actually took it seriously. Because from the from the kind of Opus Dei Roman Catholic position, mm -hmm. a Protestant evangelical is not going to heaven. They're not Catholic. Uh, they'll be lucky if they ever get out of purgatory. This is old school. And from the evangelical point of view, they never dedicated their lives to Jesus. They're worshiping Mary. So they can you know, but now they've come together in this alliance, sort of, you know, like Mussolini and Hitler working together. They don't really like each other, but they're trap, you know, companions of convenience. So I yeah. just want you to go into a little bit of who Leo is and and the background of how he's managed to build this, but also, uh, you know, this odd kind of network of Catholic evangelical true believers who are, I think, quite often sincere in what they we, they they believe, and then go in a little bit to what it is they believe, just about religious liberty and whether they believe in it at all or how to just use that as a tool. There's a lot sure. there. Sorry, I've asked. There's, no, that's questions. okay. I mean, this is. This, I mean, this is the thing about it. There's, there's so, there's so much substance and so much to explore, and so many mm -hmm. different rabbit trails that you can go down. And yeah. it, 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 and trying to under fully understand the network uh, of power. Start with money. Leo a little bit. Just give okay. So let's more. yeah, let's start with Leo a little bit. So I mean, Leo is himself a conservative Catholic. Uh, he's actually a member of a group called the Knights of Malta, which is this Catholic order that traces its origins back to the First Crusade. So quite literally a crusader. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, there. when I was researching the book, I found um, a journalist talked about um, Leo's sort of network and the Catholicism in it. And he said that this seems like something that was ripped from the pages of a Dan Brown novel. Sure, I smile. And you do, yeah, you do start to feel like you're in a basement with red string. And I think that's partly what they're trying to do, right? Like, so Leo's, he's affiliated with the Federalist Society for a long time in there, like pretty high up in that organization. Uh, he created the Judicial Crisis Network, which is sort of this, this, this kind of PR firm for getting these conservative justices, all these different organizations and all of these different ways to shuffle money around and prevent uh, people from really fully understanding the scope of it. Um, and the, Leo, the Beckett Fund, you mentioned them too. Yep. I mean, and it, 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 tied to all of those different organizations. So um, in the book, I, I, I quote somebody who says that Leo propped up the Beckett Fund for Religious mm -hmm. Liberty with some big donations early on when it was failing. Um, you know, it, it, you know, he's even got his own law school, which um, is the Antonin Scalia School of Law, which I joke in the book is acronymically challenged. Yeah, I like that. <laughs> Asshole. But, <laughs> yeah, yeah. But, you know, I mean, what I, I just want to one other thing that, that struck me about what the what you just said, the question that you just asked was especially where you started was, you know, you, you mentioned your father's book and how it was it was this clear call to go after and try to capture the courts. One of the things that I have found um, both interesting and frustrating as, as I've as I've written about this and, and talked about this over the last decade is that anybody who is not in that movement has a really hard time believing how explicit the call to capture the court was. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, like there, there are plenty of examples like your father's, but where you can say where you can point to where they are openly proclaiming the need to capture the court. And yet yeah. when I say that to uh, to progressive audiences, um, I, I, I talk to lawyers all the time. You know, I've, I've given um, uh, continuing legal education on, on this topic and on books. And and th that is met with skepticism, which is fine. But it, 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 people really need to understand that this was the mission and it was the, it was the mission because they knew the court could implement their politically unpopular ideology right yeah and they, you know there, there's a little irony there because we're awash in conspiracy theories 99.99 percent of which are utter bs or made up mm -hmm. here actually you come close to a real conspiracy <laughs> yeah. theory but i just want to say and I'm, I'm not you know this is Far from blowing my trumpet because this is shame, mm -hmm. shameful. But I was a fly on the wall when a lot of this was being hatched. You know, I went with my dad to the Oral Roberts Law School, other law schools nobody's heard mm -hmm. of. And mm -hmm. we we were sitting around doing lectures with young evangelical law students who were going there, who literally were going to law school to train to take over the judicial system mm -hmm. with the stated purpose, not subtly. But I'm here so that as I go through the system and rise higher and higher, and of course, somebody like Amy Coney Barrett was literally groomed for her position. 
Mm -hmm. And I know the people who mentored her in that weird thing she was part of with handmaids and all the rest. One thing I, I don't want to digress too far here, but I want you to go here once because I think it needs to be said as someone who has lived this on both sides mm -hmm. and knows you're not making it up. You know, that's a weird thing. Like everybody, mm -hmm. he's not making this up. I was there. <laughs> I heard the discussions. I, I appreciate it. Of, <laughs> I was part of the conspiracy. Um, one thing I want to say is just fault a lot of our prestige media. And I'll give you just one example, and I've used this before on this podcast, so I'm sorry to repeat myself, but my dad's book, A Christian Manifesto, sold a million copies, okay? And at the time, it was selling a million copies. It probably was outselling by two to three to one every single book on the New York Times bestseller list. Mm -hmm. Did they bother to review it back in 1980, whatever? No, because it was those crazy people out there somewhere. We don't pay attention to them. So then all of a sudden, you know, when... Trump is elected and everybody's sitting around at midnight saying, how did this happen? And I'm saying, we, not me anymore, but that group I represent have been working on this for 50 years. Mm -hmm. That's how it happened. And he just happened to be the right person at the right time. But there was an army to tap into of anger and, and so forth. I still fault the media uh, for not, for instance, paying more attention to your book. And, I appreciate that. And the idea that somehow you've written the essential blueprint that really explains what's going on as just take one thing, you know, why is Amy Coney Barrett on the court um, or whatever? Why has Roe been overturned? Why, by the way, is there a headline today that you and me are speaking where they're going after the abortion pill again? Mm -hmm. It's just happening again. And I keep looking at everybody saying, you know, I've been talking about this for 35, 40 years. Um you paid no attention to us when we were in the ascent. Uh, you know, where where have you all been with your investigative journalism? We were doing this in open sight, and now you're talking about the next iteration, and it's all out in the open. And I guess I'm going to ask you, and then we'll go back to your book, why don't our East and West Coast elites who all went to the same universities get it? Why don't they take this seriously? Why don't they understand that you're not making this shit up? I don't understand why the panic button wasn't pushed long ago in terms of the direct conflict with democracy and the rule of law that is now in the final stages of a program. This isn't like it's just starting. It's all already happened and it's just going to continue to go. And that's without a second Trump term. That's just yeah. what we're left with even if Biden gets reelected. Yeah. Well, you know, so I, in 2019, when my first book came out, the founding myth why Christian nationalism is un-American. Yeah. I, I went to the Religion News Writers Association conference, uh, which was in Las Vegas at the time. Mm. And uh, so this is where all the religion reporters in the country gather to 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 be with each other, to to you know advance their professionalism, to to network all that good stuff. And I was on a panel called Christian Nationalism in the Age of Trump with mm -hmm. Catherine Stewart, who wrote The Power Worshippers, um, and Jack Jenkins, who was one of the first journalists to start writing about Christian nationalism when Donald Trump was running for office. And I began that talk, and I want to say there were like somewhere around 200 religion reporters in that room, give or take 50. And I began that talk by saying that I think Christian nationalism is the biggest threat to American democracy, that yeah. it is an existential threat to a government of the people, for the people, and by the people. Okay. And no, nobody tried to follow up or ask more about that. I mean, it was, it was, it was shocking. I mean, these are the people who should know mm. um, better than anybody else um, what is happening and, and why it's a dangerous threat, why it is fundamentally opposed to democracy. Um, and, and it was kind of crickets um and i actually just posted that on my uh instagram page that video clip of that the other day and it's was it's this in 2021 when you did the january 6 2021 instagram? no this this was 20 this was in 2019 so this was oh, 20 okay 2019 yeah, before yeah 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 um so even but even before the insurrection i mean you yeah. know i mean i i, I kind of i i I didn't predict that, obviously, but I, I I definitely believed something like that was coming. That's why I was out there screaming this from from the rooftops and talking about how Christian nationalism is fundamental. Like, oh, right, like the subtitle of my book is "Why Christian Nationalism Is Un-American," and it's pretty rare that you choose a subtitle for your book and then the subject 
runs out to prove you right by attempting yeah. to overturn a free and fair election and proving itself beyond all reasonable doubt yeah. to be yeah. truly un-American. Yeah. Uh, it, it was really remarkable. Yeah, I, I uh, just want to say that we're talking to Andrew today about uh, his, we're going to call it the new book, it's 2022. Mm -hmm. um, and let's see, Andrew Sedell is constitutional and civil rights attorney. He's the author of two books, The Founding Myth, Why Christian Nationalism is on America, which proved to be sadly true, as we were just talking about, American Crusade, How the Supreme Court is Weaponizing Religious Freedom. Um, I guess the next book is How We Lost the Battle and, uh, you know, Why I'm in Jail might be the subtitle. Um, <laughs> as an em enemy of the state, when, when uh, you know, this is only half in jest when Trump is reelected. Um, and I guess, you know, I would just finish by saying that if in conversation with Frank Schaefer, the reason I keep coming back to this topic with people like Andrew and, and Marcy Hamilton and Kate Cohen and others is because... If I was in 1933 in Berlin and I had a podcast, uh, if you were getting bored with the people I invited on to warn that National Socialism was bad news and that you should believe what he was writing in Mein Kampf and go from there, and this is not a joke, uh, you know, there, there were probably people there that sounded like a broken record too. Um, so I, I would just say, you know, please subscribe to In Conversation with Frank Schaefer and share it and uh, you know, on Substack, I have my commentary I do all the time called it. It has to be said, and you can help spread the word on that. And we're going to link to everything Andrew does or thinks about uh, and get that <laughs> out there. So ha having said that, let me d dive back into the book. I want to go um, mm -hmm. to a story that you talk about in the book, and you'll know what this is. So I won't set it up. You set it up. Ray, t uh, this is uh, early in the book again, page 22. Ray took longer to die than will take you to read the opinion ignoring his religious freedom. This is Christian supremacy, and this isn't an isolated example. And that was someone put to death without the comfort of any religious help because they asked for a non-Christian chaplain. Why don't you tell that story a little bit? Let's 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 do that. Not because sadly, not because it's the only story in the book, but it's one where it gives us a feeling of just the lack of compassion, and if I can put it this way as a former evangelical, the unchristlike behavior of these people who are just disgusting. You know, we saw it again in Texas with this poor woman who's stuck with a pregnancy. Her baby's going to die. She could die. And then Paxton, you know, this world class asshole steps in and try and 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 and, and persecutes her. And the doctors and the hospitals and uh, every and, and says provider. he's going to prosecute doctors and hospitals and make it a felony if they do anything. And so go to that, but also go to this story I brought up. Yeah, this overriding hard ass meanness, in addition to everything else, this bullying presence of these Christian nationalists is just they're so mean. You can take well, that. Yes, I mean, I so. One of the things that I'm trying to do with this story is is show it, it, this is the newly weaponized version of religious freedom that mm. these Christian nationalists, that these crusaders are seeking is is religious freedom for me and not for thee. Yeah, right. This is something that only exists for them. And another one one way to think about it is they are trying to change the law so that it protects conservative white Christians at the expense of everybody else, or, or put another way, it protects, but does not bind yeah. those Christians while it binds everybody else, but does not protect them. So yeah. the story of Dominique Ray is, this is a man who is on death row. His crimes are horrible. It's the stuff of parents' nightmares. His appeals are exhausted. He's, he's going to die. Um, and a couple of weeks, uh, maybe two before his death uh, for his execution, um, he met with the warden and the warden explains this is what's going to happen, including the fact that um, the prison chaplain, who in this case is a Christian, is going to be in the execution chamber. Um, now, the way Alabama law is written is it says that the prison chaplain, who's always a Christian, uh, excuse me, may, may be present in the chamber. Um, it also allows the condemned to have uh, their their own spiritual advisor. Yeah. Um, so if, if you're not Christian, that's a nice, nice thing to have. And Ray is not a Christian. He's a Muslim. So he wants in the room, a fellow Muslim and, and actually affirmatively does not want a Christian chaplain 
in the room. And so yeah. there's confusion over whether or not that is permissible because of the way the prison's rules are written. So mm -hmm. um, the lawyers representing him ask the court to just, they're like, hey, can you just pause the execution while we get this sorted out, right? Like just delay things like a little bit in the name of religious freedom, which we understand you six conservative justices like really, really care about. Um, and so that the, the lower courts agree like, yeah, we'll do this. Um, and there, there's some really moving um, uh, rhetoric in the, the 11th circuit, which is surprising uh, given how conservative it is opinion and it says if ray were a christian he would have a profound benefit because he is a muslim he is denied a benefit mm -hmm. and the conservative block on the supreme court disagrees mm -hmm. and it issues an opinion that's two paragraphs um and the five conservative justices then at the time say ah you took too long you you didn't raise this issue soon enough meanwhile he learned about it the, the, that the issue was there on, I think it was on a Wednesday and, you know, four or five days later had already filed this, right? So like, yeah. that's that's pretty good in terms of lawyering. But yeah. Roberts, Thomas, Alito, Gorsuch, and Barrett at the time, this is before Barrett, uh, excuse me, before Barrett is on the court. So I didn't mean Barrett, I meant Kavanaugh. Um, they're in such a rush to see Ray executed that they ignored the religious freedom of this dying man, effectively. Yeah. But it's because he's a black Muslim, not a white Christian. Yeah. Right. So unlike every Christian that Alabama execute, Ray died without that religious consolation. His sure. his spiritual advisor was not in the room and nor was the Christian chaplain, which was this this last minute concession. And it was because the justices issued that in that decision in two paragraphs. And this is something that you can see elsewhere, too. Right. This is not just something that happened in this one instance, like take take the Muslim ban case, right. religious freedom um, was a huge issue. That same term, just a couple weeks earlier at the Supreme Court, it was considering that gay wedding cake case out of Colorado, where the religious right. freedom of the Christian baker made a huge difference to the justices. But when it came to the religious uh, freedom of Muslim immigrants, who cares? That's not something that we need to worry about. And, and, and there's data too. So there's not just stories, there's not just anecdotes, there's data to back this up. And this, this to me is, is, is crucial because it also shows us that the ploy to capture the court has worked. But you um, know, an interesting example you bring up and I'll ask you to go there is yeah. that it's kind of, there was an example you used in your book that reminded me of, of, you know, what happened with the smoking lobby in the sense that at one point, you know, the big tobacco companies weighed in and they wanted to, they basically lied to Congress and everybody else and tried mm -hmm. to get an exemption. And then the, conservative justices basically did to guns what the smoking lobby had once done to oh, tobacco. Yeah. And so they kind of had a dry run at this. Um, it's interesting, you write, if this seems impossible or unlikely or conspiratorial, know mm -hmm. that the conservatives have already succeeded in previous crusades. This is precisely what they did for the Second Amendment. In 1977, absolutists took, took over the National Rifle Association and converted an organization that had advocated for firearm safety, education, and recreational shooting into a powerhouse focused exclusively on rewriting the Second Amendment into a personal individual right to own a gun. The NRA's new leadership, and you're quoting somebody else, was dogmatic and overly ideological. For the first time, the organization formally embraced the idea that that the sacred Second Amendment was at the heart of its concerns, explained Michael Waldman, a law professor, who wrote a biography of the Second Amendment. Now, you know, the reason I'd mention this is that, again, the longevity of this program, mm -hmm. you take the Second Amendment, you turn it on its head, you turn it into an open carry law everywhere where people now can have firearms, where New York, their laws get struck down so that everybody's lives get more dangerous, everything's more precarious, kids are being shot in their houses because everybody's got guns now. It's almost kind of a dry run for the way the whole idea of religious liberty has been turned on oh, its yeah. head. But for a completely different social agenda than the intention in the Constitution or the Bill of Rights or anywhere else. And I just think that kind of way of operation, again, we're very naive to not understand that these are not isolated incidents. This is part of a long program of a minority right wing view seeking to impose its vision of our country on a majority that does not share 
um, it, its views. And I thought it was very interesting. You used the gun example and very telling. So maybe you want to talk about that a little. Yeah, bit. I mean, I, I think it's really it's it's an instructive example of how the law can be deliberately manipulated and a constitutional right can change mm -hmm. when you have a well-funded uh minority that is that is doing you know focused pressure campaigns to make it happen you know chief justice warren Berger, um there's this famous quote he says the second amendment was the subject of ha or has been the subject of one of the greatest pieces of fraud i repeat the word fraud that's mm -hmm. him not me um uh that i have ever seen in my lifetime right and and the crusade is trying to do the exact same thing with religious freedom except that it's happening so much faster so i mean so much faster and and again we have the data to back this up so there have been a couple studies that have crunched the numbers and those studies don't cover the two most recent terms of the supreme court which mm. have been huge wins for the crusaders um so the numbers that i'm about to tell you are significantly more dramatic mm. um now than than what i'm about to say but before the court was captured the court ruled in favor of religion about half the time, right? And that's what you'd expect, you know, like you give it, given a shot of winning a case before the Supreme Court, ah, 50-50, right? Yeah. But under John Roberts, since he's taken over, one study found that that win rate goes from just under 50 up to 81%, okay? And, and, and the critical thing for people to understand is that this is not a pro-religion shift. This is a pro-Christian shift. Again, this yeah. is... Dominique Ray being a Muslim and not getting to have a chaplain in the execution chamber. This is well, the not Muslim just a pro-Christian shift, a pro-reconstructionist Protestant view that, you know, yeah, eventually Christian nationalist shift. Yeah, yeah, it's a Christian nationalist shift. Yeah. So and, and the numbers back it up because so in early courts, Christianity was favored in 44 percent of the cases mm -hmm. under Roberts. That number doubles and goes up to 85 mm percent. -hmm. Right. So so religious freedom has become a weapon of Christian privilege. That has already happened. And, and what I try to do with American Crusade is I try to put a face on those numbers and prove yeah. that the new guiding principle of this captured Supreme Court is not the Constitution, it's not the law, but this. Yeah. Christianity wins. That's it. And, That's... and what's interesting to me is, is that the big point that I take from your book, I mean, there are many big points, but one of them is this sort of two-tier justice system where oh, you yeah. know if you're a white evangelical or roman catholic with conservative views everything is slanted in your direction oh yeah and if you happen to be an agnostic an atheist a jew a liberal roman catholic a liberal protestant uh, you know a non-sectarian anybody a hindu let alone a muslim someone it's favor it, you know it is this is not equality before the law and and i just want to ask you a question here I thought a huge example you use in your book, sort of a tipping point, an inflection point, was the story of the Supreme Court uh, where Bush versus Gore happened. And you say it is a politicized body and packed with political activists. Three of the current justices worked for Bush on the Bush v. Gore yeah. litigation, Kavanaugh, Roberts, and Barrett. So, you know, you make a historical case that pre-Trump, the, the, the machinery of this change was already in place enough. So they even got to decide uh, one presidential election. And I, I just thought maybe you want to talk about that a little bit, because that's kind of where the, that's sort of the beginning of the dam breaking, it, where you can really measure it. Yeah, you know, I mean, I it it is hard to pinpoint, but I, that was certainly a watershed moment. One of them. Um, yeah. yeah, I mean, it, it really, really was. I mean, you know, Kavanaugh worked in the Bush White House. He married a Bush aide. He was on Ken Starr's team pursuing Bill Clinton. He even drafted final uh, parts of the, the Starr report. Yeah. Um, you know, I mean, like the, these people are are political activists. Yeah. Uh, they're not these impartial jurists that they, 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 you know, it should be the case that they put on a robe and all of those preconceptions fall away. But like, remember what Kavanaugh did in his confirmation hearing, mm -hmm. he promised partisan retribution on his yeah. political enemies, enemies, yeah. right? You're, you're going to reap the whirlwind. You're going to suffer consequences. What goes around? Very much what, what, very much what Trump is saying now, if he gets yeah. real. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, yeah. And, and and all of that goes to also the fact that we were talking about, like Leonard, Leonard Leo was the, quote, monitor of the nominee's ideological purity. Like these yeah. people were chosen for their ideology, for the purity 
of their ideology. And that should chill all of us yeah. um, and, and really ought to call into question the fact that uh, whether or not they are these these impartial jurists. And, you know, I, I think a lot of people out there might be thinking of John Roberts. They've they've read mainstream media stories about how maybe he's a moderate. Um, but, you know, I mean, this is a guy who litigated cases alongside crusaders, including sure. the American Center for Law and Justice. Um, you know, I mean, well, if he... you move the goalposts enough, you get moderate. I mean, if, yeah. if everything keeps going to the right, then the guy that was the hard, you know, John Bircher in 1950 now looks mm -hmm. moderate because he pays lip service to democracy or something. I mean, it you know, it just keeps sliding. Yeah. And he I mean, he worked in the Reagan White House. And, you know, yeah. one of the one of the quotes that I include in the book uh, was from a, a legal memo that he wrote. Uh, and in it, he wrote, we still have an uphill battle to return prayer to schools. Yeah. Right. And just to just think of we we battle return prayer to schools. Right. That that is the language That's of a language. crusader. Well, and if you look at what's happening now um, and, and I know this sounds even more conspiratorial, but again, I know so many of these people. I grew up with Franklin Graham. You know, I, I knew the people involved in Republican politics in the Reagan era, the Bush era. I knew what they thought the best of all worlds would be, which is sort mm -hmm. of where we are now and how we sort of incrementally built toward that. And I don't think I'm imagining things when there's a sort of a two steps forward, one step back to kind of let everybody relax for a minute. We're going to ban you know, we're going to overturn Roe v. Wade. We won't handle the abortion pill yet or gay marriage. We'll get to that eventually. Now we'll reconsider the abortion pill, you know, and then we'll do something more moderate and then it'll become more radical. I don't think Leo and these guys are, are. Um, I don't think I'm imagining things in, in the fact that they also are thinking strategically on these issues. No, you're not. I mean, and this this is why people wrongly think that john roberts is a moderate yeah it's exactly. not it, it's not because his ideology is not as conservative as it comes he wants all of the same things that barrett and alito and sure and, and, and the most conservative thomas most conservative ones want he just has the intelligence to understand that if they push for too much change too fast Mm -hmm. They're going to lose the legitimacy of that change. They're going to risk it sticking. It's the slowly boiled frog analogy. Yeah. That's what Roberts wants to do. He's not trying to throw somebody into a pot of boiling water. He wants to slowly, but he wants to check every single thing on the conservative wish list. He just believes that to do that, they have to do slower, more incremental changes where you have, whereas you have people like, like Alito and Thomas who are just drunk on power and ready to do whatever it takes right now. But, but the key thing is, you are absolutely right. They are coming for contraception. They are yeah. coming for marriage equality. They're coming for no fault yeah. of war. I mean, like there is no amount of power or privilege that is going to satisfy the Christian nationalists or the crusaders. Mm -hmm. they, they are not going to stop until we stop them. Yeah, and their means are going to have to be increasingly uh, anti-democratic and also yes. brutal, as we saw te in Texas, going after yes. this poor woman and making an example of her and threatening her doctors with prison because they know they don't represent the majority. And so it's a strategy, as you point out clearly in your book, that is geared to keeping power when you don't represent the majority of the people. And I, I, want, I want to just reintroduce you a second. Andrew Seidel uh, is a constitutional civil rights attorney. He's the author of two books, The Founding Myth, Why Christian Nationalism is Un-American, and more recently, American Crusade, How the Supreme Court is Weaponizing Religious Freedom. I want to turn the page uh, here and just tell people, first of all, you've got to buy the book, you've got to read it and and um, digest it. And as part of the battle strategy for going into 2024, if you don't understand what Andrew's written about in this book, don't count yourself as ready for that battle, because this is the book that lays out the priorities. And I'm being serious. This is it. If I had a book to hand, everybody say, look, you know, this will prepare you for what you need to know to fight this battle intelligently. If you want to help not see a second Trump term, this would be a book you want to read. I want to turn the page a little bit here. And as as two white males, 171, I don't know how you how old you are, Andrew. How old are you? Uh, what year is it? I'm I'm 41. <laughs> OK, so, you know, we're on this path. You know, I'm closer to death than you are. And I'll you know, I'll tell you what it's like to slide over the cliff and and uh, and so forth and so on. But in all seriousness, you know, there are a number of projects that jump out of your book, um, not secondary projects, they're primary. It seems to me that the biggest target 
painted on anybody's back in America right now in terms of what you're talking about in your book are women. And I am so outraged of having played an early part in this anti-feminist juggernaut that was then unleashed by the people who followed my father and to some extent me and Dr. Coop on just the abortion issue and how this now translates into they're coming for contraceptives. They're telling you to have babies, but there's no mandatory paid paternity leave. They're telling you to have babies and no one's going to help you with childcare. They're telling you to have babies and they've designed an entire industrial capitalist system to make sure that if you're not pursuing your career at 100%, you won't get anywhere. So they're pro-family. They won't do anything for you to have a family. I am so livid as a father and grandfather and an American citizen, and as a human being, if I can put it that way, mm -hmm. I am so outraged by the targeting of women. I just don't know even where to begin, but let's talk for a minute about the implications of your book. You have so many implications, but let's just follow this logic out. You know, let's call it what it is, the crusader Amy Coney Barrett treason against women in the name of extreme religion. And there are a lot of ways we can go with your book, but I can't think of anybody who's more under the gun in terms of this agenda. The crusader agenda is not to retake Jerusalem right now. It is to push women back a thousand years in terms of, of evolutionary development. Forget feminism, just basic evolution of hunter-gatherer societies where women have an equal right because they need to survive. I just think that this is the biggest thing out there in terms of just like if if we don't fight for women right now, then just shut the fuck up for forever, because this is really the fight. And I really mean that. I don't know how I can state it more strongly than I just did, but I want you to go there for a while. No, I mean, I, I appreciate the, the strength of that statement. Um, and I I agree. I mean, I, th I think I think women are are t are targeted. Right now, I mean, they they truly are. You know, conservative white Christian Americans' status as the dominant group in our society is, you know, it's it's on the wane. It's been under threat. It has been for some time, right? They they they're they're losing the culture wars. You know, mm -hmm. this this silly phrase that is meant to mask attacks on human rights. Um, their benighted ideas and ideology are are wildly unpopular. Um, mm -hmm. They're losing the power and the privilege and the deference which they believe they are due. You know, I mean, like, like think about um, the, the latest numbers. Uh, Seventy-one percent of Americans support marriage equality. Christian mm -hmm. nationalists oppose it. Um, they want to outlaw abortion. Eighty-five percent of Americans think it should be legal in some way, shape, or form. Yeah, they want a nation of Christians like them. Seventy-three percent of Americans are more welcoming and want religious pluralism. Mm -hmm. They're they'd almost certainly like to ban contraception too, right? But but something like 91% of Americans mm -hmm. are in favor. And those numbers terrify them. They they are they are scared. And and that is why they are seeking this minority rule. That's the why yeah. that lies at the heart of of this this rise of Christian nationalism, the push to weaponize religious freedom, the assaults on abortion. They are scared because of the people who believe in marriage equality mm -hmm. and and think abortion should be legal and don't want a Christian nation because nuns are on the rise because Americans are re leaving religious behind uh, religion behind mm -hmm. because we elected our first black president because we elected a black female vice president because every day we are closer to racial and gender and LGBTQ equality mm -hmm. that. That is the why that lies at the heart of this, because we know that when a dominant group or a caste in a society feels threatened, that it reacts or overreacts in ways to retain that status. Yeah. That is that's why they're turning to Christian nationalism. That's and why speaking they're speaking of which there never was any exception for the health of the mother. Well, I mean, I, th I think that's that's it's all bullshit. I, it's all window dressing. They're never I mean, was. that's what Paxton is. Proving hey, to if, us. I, I just have this to say to people, and I <laughs> yeah. know this is supposed to be a podcast and I, I'm supposed to remain cool. Apologies, Ernie, but I'm just telling you everybody out there and I'm not going to saddle you with this, Andrew. This is just me speaking. I don't speak for you. But honestly, if you want to know what this movement of crusaders is about, and if you are a woman or an, a halfway decent male, if you want to know the future for women in America, look at Iran today. And if you want to know who, the kind of people that women are supposed to enter to in this new environment, just 
get a nice big picture of Paxton. This man is threatening doctors with prison for taking care of their patient. That's your future if we reelect Donald Trump. What's I mean, that? that's what a Christian, that's what a Christian nationalist state looks like. And also, I mean, I think it's worth pointing out that it is, it does show how hollow and absurd it is to try to push these bans into place with these carve outs for the life and health of the mother. That's what we're talking about in this case. Yeah. And they don't care. I mean, so when you hear these 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 politicians try to militate their rule inhumane positions by saying, oh, we have carve outs for rape and incest and, and the um, life and health of the mother that think of what is happening in Texas right now. No, they don't. Well, and thank God in a way for his stupidity, as opposed to what you were talking about, about the cleverer people on the court who yeah. are doing this incrementally, because he just, you know, he said, no, we're going to boil the frog now, turn it up to 100 degrees yeah. and kill it. So in a way, thank you, Paxton, because we look at you and we know what our future holds if we just go down this path a little further. Well, and and, and to to circle back just a little bit to 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 the why of mm -hmm. this and to tying it in with with this anti-woman ideology on of Christian nationalism and on the right and it's right as as we realize as a society as we as we progress and as we realize the values that are implicit in we the people mm -hmm. right that we the people means all the people not just this the select few and and equal justice under law which are the words that are carved into the edifice of the supreme court and and these other founding maxims right as we recognize that humans are human and worthy of rights. Conservative white Christian America is dying this slow demographic death and it is rebelling. And mm -hmm. they are raging against the dying of their privilege. And so they declared war. And they declared war on women. They declared war on LGBTQ people. They declared war on anybody that doesn't look like them. They are so accustomed to seeing a narrow world that reflects only their straight white conservative patriarchy. Mm -hmm. That the existence, let alone the equality, of anybody else feels like a threat to them. Mm. And that is the why that underlies this whole movement that we are fighting against right now. Let me just ask you a question. It's a detail here, but Ernie, my producer, always sends me things that then lead to great things. So I'm going to pass on his question. Knowing that his wife, Ginny, is so deeply tied to the Ooh. insurrection, is there anything that can be done about Clarence Thomas when it comes to the cases the court hears about January 6th, to which he's not only related, but his wife is should be actually, you know, in the in, as part, you know, she should be prosecuted, I think, in terms of her own role in that. Yeah, I mean, the so for, for people who don't know a little, let's just do a little background on Jimmy Thomas. She has really deep ties to the Crusader Network, including this, um, this group called the Council for National Policy, which is this sort of sh sort of shadowy, really powerful organization that most people have never heard of, the Heritage Foundation, including others that that are litigating these cases before the Supreme Court. Um, she wrote, uh, there's a listserv that Justice Thomas and all of his clerks and Ginny Thomas are on, this email list. Um, and on the eve of January 6th, you have them exchanging these messages on there that they're praying on their knees that January 6th will see the truth and, um, you know, shine a light on people's hearts about the stolen election. Um, John Eastman, John Eastman, that name should ring a bell for some people. He's the legal architect behind the insurrection on January 6th, right? Um, he is kind of involved. He was on that list, sir. He's a former and Thomas. By the way, Lawrence. helped a little bit by Mike Johnson, the current Speaker of the House. Oh, yeah. 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 I mean, and, and so, so Ginny, Ginny has these, these, these ties um, mm -hmm. and has created these organizations. We know Leonard Leo has, has funneled her money and tried to keep it quiet. There's all these damning revelation after damning revelation coming out to the point where, where it is clear that Clarence Thomas should really not be sitting on pretty much any case um, that involves January 6th or involves a lot of these or organizations that are submitting briefs on the other side. The, the problem that we face is that this Supreme court regulates itself. Um, there's no binding ethics code on this Supreme Court that prevents them from doing things. And one of the, I often talk about solutions to a captured court. What can we do now that the Supreme Court has been packed and captured? Um, mm -hmm. and, and ethics code is one of them, a binding ethics code with some teeth. Um, but one of the questions I often get asked, which I think we're kind of alluding to a little bit here is, well, let's impeach Clarence Thomas. And I, 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 two things to say about this. One is, I think we found out during the Trump era 
that impeachment is not a realistic check mm. on political power. Uh, it made sense when we were drafting the Constitution um, it, as an idea. It 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 seems to work, but it 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 is not an effective check at all. And we have seen the amount of money and political capital that the other side is willing to spend to capture the court. I mean, think again, think back to the Brett Kavanaugh confirmation to put Brett Kavanaugh on the court, to jam Amy Coney Barrett onto the court, even though millions of Americans have already voted in the election. And that was supposedly why we couldn't uh, allow Barack Obama, sure. Barack Obama's nominee uh, to even have a hearing. Right. Uh, when when McConnell. Uh, stopped Merrick Garland from even getting a hearing and then eventually put uh, Neil Gorsuch on the case, right? Like on the court, excuse me. But there, there is, if they are willing to spend that kind of political capital and that kind of money to pack the court, there's zero chance that they are going to vote to it. And you talk about the Clarence need to Thomas. expand the court somehow mm -hmm. as in to dilute this thing, go there a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think that is absolutely one of the solutions. I think that um, having a binding ethics code is super important. I think that having um, uh, term limits is a really interesting solution. I think there, that is constitutionally problematic, um, given the language in the Constitution and the people who interpret the language of the Constitution, namely the justices on the Supreme Court. Um, but we know, and it is clear, that the number of justices on the Supreme Court is set by Congress. Congress right. can change the number on, of justices on the Supreme Court at any time. On average, we've done that once every 30 or so years throughout American history. Um, Mitch McConnell changed the size of the Supreme Court when it suited his political ends, right? We just talked about it. Uh, blocking Merrick Garland, he knocked the size of the Supreme Court down to eight uh, for almost a year and a half and then put it back up to nine when it suited his political ends. It's very, very common for this to happen. And I think that when an outside organization um, or, or, or a group network of organizations spends half a billion dollars to capture one branch of our government, that that is not something we can allow to stand. No, that and I, I, I want to go to one thing just in terms of one more example of why mm -hmm. we can't allow this to stand. You have some very moving passages that I hardly dare read as a father and grandfather about the damage to children mm -hmm. in terms of religious rights being put a above everything else, whether it's corporal punishment. I mean, you have this line that actually I hard, have a hard time saying here, you know, the, the the shape of a coat hanger on a little child's cheek where they've been beaten um, in the name of religious liberty and, you know, and your whole discourse on, well, you know, I believe God told me to do this. You have these shocking stories and there's so many of them. You're just wishing as you read this, come on, come on, Andrew, you're exaggerating. This can't be true. This can't be true. Yeah. They're all true. So we're going to have to wrap this up in a minute, but, you know, I had talked with Marcy Hamilton about this and Kate Cohen yeah. and others, and I just want to make sure that people understand that this is not some sort of legal framework and we're worried about, you know, Justice Thomas and, and, and this is children. And, you know, if, if religion on a, in a positive sense is about anything, family or rights or whatever, when you see the brutality of the Paxtons of this world, when they affirm their idea of religious liberty includes beating children, includes a kind of a homeschool movement that likes to remove their kids from the world so they can do to them whatever they think God's telling them to do. I'll just leave it there. And then, you know, we yeah. will wrap some of this up, but please go there a little bit. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I mean, especially I think this is a really important point especially now because we're seeing this sort of another wave of like quote unquote parental rights um being used by by christian nationalists by groups like moms for liberty to yeah. as an attempt to kind of undermine and destroy really really destroy public education yeah uh, but but so often um children end up being the victims of this and and and, and the, the overall point that i think it's crucial for people to understand is none of our rights or freedoms are absolute with, with the possible exception of our right to think freely mm -hmm. uh, every single right that we possess as an american comes with certain limits uh, including your second amendment you know try to carry a gun to the supreme court or onto a plane Right. Like our freedom of speech is limited by you can't have you can't make actual death threats against somebody. Right. That is illegal. Um, and, and 
This holds for religious freedom too. And one of the things that we are seeing, one of the ways that they are trying to weaponize religious freedom specifically for this, this one chosen group of Christians is to remove all of those limits. But, but historically, religious freedom has never been an absolute right. It has always come with limits. And, and those limits often begin where the rights of other people begin. Right? There's this old legal adage that your right to swing your fist ends where the other person's nose begins. Mm -hmm. Your right to exercise your religion ends where the rights of other people begin. And that includes children. And I, I think parents in some of these really conservative religious sect, sects and, and courts who are adjudicating these cases lose sight of that. And I'm yeah. sure Marcy can give you a lot more examples. But the one that always comes to mind for me, um, there are these, there are there are graveyards in Idaho where a particular Christian sect that refuses to seek medical care and believes in praying instead, uh, where these these graveyards are just filled with children, hmm. just just filled with kids that could be saved by things like antibiotics hmm. and and insulin, and instead these parents effectively kill their children through religious neglect. Um, and I, that is not something that I think is within a religious freedom right. I do not think they have the right to kill any more than people who claim that Jesus um, wants to take the wheel and would drive down a highway going 80 miles an hour without uh, control of their vehicle have a right to risk other people's lives and health and safety. Um, that is not something that is encompassed within religious freedom, nor should it be. You know, I'm glad you you brought that up. And again, when you read the book, um, Andrew's book, you will find things in this that sadly, I can put it this way, are not only believable, but are actually happening. I'm talking with Andrew L. Seidel about his book, American Crusade, how the Supreme Court is weaponizing religious freedom. I'm adding your book, um, Andrew, to my new book club called It Has to Be Read. Uh, my commentary well, well, has to be said. So um, it has to be read is something uh, that Ernie came up with, my producer. And we're going to follow this through and add certain books that literally have to be read. Um, Andrew is an expert in this field. And conceived and organized the groundbreaking Christian nationalism at the January 6, 2021 insurrection report, which he contributed to and briefed Congress on. Uh, we will link to that report uh, wherever this episode appears. We will link to your two books, Andrew. We will Thank put you. your book on. It has to be read. <laughs> we will have you back. And I just have one favor to ask everybody. Please subscribe to my Substack commentary, It Has to be Said. And on that, I will be promoting these It Has to Be Read events as well. And then, Andrew, do me a favor. Um, when we sign off here, please talk to Ernie. And mm -hmm. just like Marcy Hamilton and Kate Cohen uh, and Catherine Stewart, you know, these good people mentioned you and said, you know, when are you going to talk to Andrew? I know you know some people we don't know about or authors or researchers or activists Um related mm -hmm. to what you're doing or something else, please help us find the next, it has to be said, it has to be read guest because we are gonna just keep you know, on to these issues, but we need your help because you know so much and we're looking for people to talk to that will help us get this further and then come back. And if you ever wanna come back as a guest and bring somebody with you to you know, go further in what you're saying on this, yeah. we're not like we're done here. We were not done here. Um, we, we want this to continue. So. Thank I you. hope this is the first of many conversations. And yeah, I, I and truly really thank appreciate you. the kind words. Yeah, so and you. and and I really, really am a fan of yours. Um, much yeah. love to you. Kisses. You, you as well. Thank you so much. I really appreciate this. Yeah, me too. Bye. Bye bye.